Today we're going to cover the surface anatomy of the eye first. So when we're looking at the surface anatomy of the eye, the technical name for the eyelids are the palpebra. And so we have a superior palpebra and an inferior palpebra. Where they come together at the corner, corners of the eye, we have a commissure. So where they come together at the lateral edge is the lateral commissure. And where they come together at the medial edge is the medial commissure. As we look at an eye, the dark area in the eye is the pupil. The colored area around that is the iris. And the white area of the eye is the sclera of the eye. Now, the eye itself is covered by epithelial tissue. If we were to pull the eyelids down, which we can't on this picture, then there would be a nice pink, uh, shiny surface. So you could do this looking in a mirror. And that would be the palpebral conjunctiva. And it covers the inside of the lower and upper eyelid. And then we have a shiny surface that covers the white of the eye. And so that would be the bulbar conjunctiva. As you'll recall, we have a ridge on our skull called the superciliary ridge, which is where our eyebrow sits. And just under that, where the eyelid comes across the uh, supraorbital margin we learned in the skull, we get a little crease in our eye right there. And that's the superior, south, superior palpebral sulcus. And then the same is true on the bottom of the eye here. We have an inferior palpebral sulcus. And then the opening in the eye itself that between the two eyelids is the palpebral fissure. And then the transparent covering that covers the part of the eye where the iris and the pupil uh, exist is called the cornea of the eye. And down here we can see the cornea of the eye. We can see what we were just talking about where there's a covering over the inside of the eyelid, which is the palpebral, uh, the palpebral conjunctiva, which is the covering over the eye, and then the bulbar conjunctiva covering this part of the eye itself. For our eye to function, we have to continually clean it because we walk around in an environment with an atmosphere that's not... Uh, it's got dust particles and other things in it. So we have an apparatus that cleans our eye continually. So in the upper lateral margin of the eye, we have a, a lacrimal gland. It has several little ducts that open to the inside of the upper eyelid called lacrimal ducts. The solution it makes, which we commonly call tears, is lacrimal solution. And it washes the eye from the upper lateral aspect of the eye across toward that medial uh, aspect of the eye. And right in the edge of the eyelids here, we have little openings called puncta. So we have a superior uh, lacrimal puncta and an inferior lacrimal puncta. They're just where the little disc in your eye is, the lacrimal carnuncle. So these puncta pick up the tears and move them through canals, the superior lacrimal canal and the inferior lacrimal canal into a large area called the lacrimal sac. From there, there's a little duct that carries it into your nose called the nasolacrimal duct. And what we do is we dump this fluid constantly in our nose that keeps our nose moist for when we're breathing in and out. So we don't usually have a runny nose, but you'll notice that if your eyes water your nose runs because of this connection in this duct. As you'll recall, when we did the skull, there was a little groove beside our nose called the lacrimal sulcus. And what sits in this groove is that lacrimal sac. And then there's a hole that extends down into the nose, which was called, is called the lacrimal foramen. And what passes through the hole is the nasolacrimal duct. And then the fluid then is is dumped on the underneath side of our inferior concha that we learned when we did the skull. So recall when we did muscles that we learned the muscles of the eye. 
So remember we have four rectus muscles. So we have the superior rectus that we can see here, the lateral rectus that we see here. If I remove the lateral rectus, then we can see a rectus muscle that's below the eye, the inferior rectus. And if I pull back the superior rectus muscle, we can see a medial rectus muscle on the medial aspect of the eye. And then as we tip the model, we can see a muscle that's just superior to the medial rectus, which is the superior oblique muscle. It has a tendon that passes through this trochlea, and then it attaches posterior to the eye here. And then if we look below the eye, we can see a muscle that's down in here that we can see from this angle. And then we can see running underneath the eye here, which is the inferior oblique muscle. So the new information we want to attach to that uh, for our purposes now are the nerves that innervate them. And so most of the muscles are done by the ocular motor nerve. The exceptions are the lateral rectus, which is done by the abducens, and then the superior oblique, which is done by the trochlear nerve. So this little cartilage ring here is called a trochlea that the tendon runs through, and so the nerve gets its name from this cartilage ring, the, tr the trochlea, so it's the trochlear nerve that innervates that. Now we have two sets of internal muscles within the eye. So we have muscles that uh, go around the pupil, so it's called the circular iris muscles. Then we have muscles that radiate away from that, so those are called the radial iris muscles. The circular iris muscles allow us to constrict our pupil, and the radial iris muscles allow us to dilate our pupil. And we can actually see those better up here in the chart. The little circular iris muscles are the white bands going around the pupil here, and the radial iris muscles are radiating away from it. And those muscles are also done by the ocular motor nerve. Now, if we pull our eye apart, then we actually have a muscle that allows us to change the shape of the lens uh, so that we can change from near or far vision. So when we look at this red structure, which is called the ciliary body, there are white fibers that we see on the inside, which is the ciliary muscle. And the ciliary muscle allows us to change the shape of our lens that allows us to adjust from near vision as if reading a book to far vision looking out at a distance. Now when we look at the eye, the eye is constructed with layers. The outermost layer is the white layer we're seeing here, which is the sclera of the eye. So you'll notice the sclera of the eye is somewhat continuous with the optic nerve that exits the back of the eye. If we pull the sclera away, then the innermost layer we'll see has a lot of um, has a lot of blood vessels in it, and it's very dark, and so it's called the choroid coat. Now, as we pull the choroid coat away, what we'll notice is we have an inner layer that we can see, which is this tan-colored layer, which is the retina of the eye. So, if we're looking at it this way, then we're seeing the sclera as the outer aspect of the eye. The choroid coat is next, and then the retina is the innermost layer of the eye. Now, as we look at the back of the eye, there's actually a, a viscous body that fills in the back of the eye and helps retain, retain its shape. So it's depicted by this, this piece of plastic here. And so it's called the vitreous body. And the vitreous body fills in this entire uh, posterior cavity of the eye. And then in front of it, we actually have an anterior cavity of the eye, which would be inside the cornea, which presently isn't here, uh, and between the cornea and the lens, and then between the lens and the vitreous body. And that makes up the anterior cavity of the eye. The anterior cavity of the eye can be subdivided into a posterior chamber behind the lens and an anterior chamber in front of the lens. So if we look at this cross-sectional view of the eye here, 
then the vitreous body would fill in this part of the eye. So the anterior cavity is from this line to the inside of the cornea right here. And so the lens is the separator. So this would be the posterior chamber uh, between the lens and the pupil here. And then the, excuse me, the lens and the iris. And then the anterior chamber of the eye, which we've seen here. And we have an aqueous fluid that's found in here called aqueous humor. And from a clinical stand, uh, standpoint, a buildup of the aqueous humor of the eye uh, creates a, a condition that we call glaucoma. As we're indicating, if we, if we pull the layers apart, then in the posterior cavity of the eye, we have this vitreous body. And it keeps the retina in place. As we move forward, we have this red thing, which is the ciliary body. And the edge of the ciliary body where the retina attaches is called the aura serotic because it's got a serrated edge. And then again, we have a ridge here, which is the ciliary process. And it's what makes aqueous humor. And then we have the muscles, the ciliary muscle that we talked about that's going to uh, allow us to change the shape of our lens. Now when we look at the back of this, we, we have the, the parts of the eye that are involved in creating a signal that is sent forward to the brain. So as you'll look right here, there's a little purple uh, round area right here, which is called the macula latte. And this is where the load, load of cones occur so that we get uh, acute color vision. Where the nerve forms is called the optic disc. And we actually have a blind spot here. And in lab, we'll actually demonstrate a way that we can, we can see this blind spot in our eye. Normally, we fill across the blind spot with the colors at the edge so that the blind spot doesn't exist. So this is a model of the eye and we can see the layers of the eye on this side. So the inner eye would be here, so the outermost part of the eye is here. So this layer represents the sclera of the eye, which would be the outer covering. This next layer, because of its high amount of vascular network, would be the choroid coat, although in our eye and in the sheep eye when you dissect it, it'll be really black, and they didn't color it black in the model. And then this is all the retina of and so when we look at the retina of the eye, it starts, its outermost layer is called the pigmented epithelium because in our eye, this would be very dark colored with melanin as well to absorb light. And then these are rods and cones. Uh, and so the thicker ones are cones that allow us to see color vision. The thinner ones are rods that we use primarily in day-night vision. And they're modified neurons. So this would be the dendrites, this would be the cell body, and this would be the axons of them. So we call these the outer segments because they are, are, have folded membranes where pigments are housed. And so this is the outer segments of the rods and cones. This is the cell bodies of the rods and cones dominated by their nuclei. And then in this area, the rods and cones synapse with these bipolar neurons right here. So we call this the outer synaptic layer where rods and cones snaps with bipolar neurons. And then the next band we see is the nuclei of these bipolar neurons. And then this is the bipolar neuron dendrites. And then they synapse with these ganglion cells in this layer right here. So this is called the inner synaptic layer because it's closer to the inner part of the eye. And then these are the cell bodies of the ganglion cells. And then these axons of the ganglion cells all coalesce together to form the optic nerve at the optic disc. So over here what they've done is they've just taken the rods and cones and enlarged them so that you can actually see we have these outer segments of rods and cones, then we have this body of the rods and cones, and then we have the dendrites that would be synapsing with the bipolar neurons.